starting the recording. Perfect. Good to go, Keith. Okay, so welcome back. I hope everyone had uh, a good lunch. Uh, one of the things I have uh, come to appreciate since I've been president of University Faculty Senate is just the important role of our health sciences sector in, um, in the University Faculty Senate and, and SUNY in general, um, in terms of you know, the biomedical research, the 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 health uh, the health scholarship that's going on, as well as as the role that SUNY plays in um, producing so much of the healthcare workforce. So it's, I'm very pleased that um, this second panel of the of the conference is <clears throat> improving healthcare through break through breakthrough research. Uh, and uh, again, we will have four panelists presenting today. We will have uh, Gerald Gatos from SUNY Oswego, Rebecca or Becky uh, Higgin Higginbottom from SUNY Oneonta, Leanna Kalawinski from University of Buffalo, and Tyler Rowland at University of Buffalo as well. Uh, and I'll let each of them introduce their their topic and and and. Um, uh, when we when we get to them in turn, uh, we will, uh, like I say, pretty much follow the format of the first panel. Uh, presenters, please take up to you know twelve minutes to present your work. We'll hold questions until um, the end of the session. I encourage uh, ev everyone on the on the call to go ahead and put questions into the chat. I will be moderating the chat and, and looking at it. And I can pull up some of those questions at the end, or we can also go into, uh, you know, raise your hand, open mic kind of thing. So I'm um, looking forward to the conversation. And with that, let me turn it over to Gerald as our first uh, presenter of this panel. Thank you, Gerald. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gerald. I'm a biomedical health informatics graduate student from SUNY Oswego, and I'm going to discuss and share with you guys my capstone project. It's entitled Investigating Suicidal Risk Through Blood-Based Transcriptomes and Brain Gene Algorithm. So to give you like a brief background about the project, we all know that suicidal, suicide is a global public health challenge experiencing, but experienced by everyone. Like it, affects all ages. It affects the young individuals, the adults, and even the elderly. And it also transcends beyond um, geography, culture, and social economic status. Aside from the individuals who are affected by suicidality, they also, I mean, it also affects, um, it also inflicts emotional, um, social, and mental consequences or stresses on their family members or even friends. And we all know that suicidality is a very complex and multifaceted disorder. It affects um, functional and biological pathways or, of our body. And suicidality, um, to be precise with um, neuropsychiatric disorders, it is difficult to diagnose. At the same time, it's difficult to treat and even monitor. Looking back, if we think about understanding a medical condition, um, to be specific, um, to understand the molecular dynamics of a molecular uh, of a medical condition, what we usually do is to perform like tissue sampling. So, just to give you like an idea, since we're since we're dealing with um suicidality, which most which affects the brain. It's just intuitive, intuitive to use brain tissue samples. But the thing with that, I know that it's gonna provide accurate results or accurate information about the molecular dynamics that's happening in the brain. But the thing with tissue sampling is it is very unethical at the same time, it's very invasive to someone who's, I mean, leaving and then just get tissue sample, which is not like appropriate. And with that, we are trying to investigate suicide risks through blood-based transcriptomes and brain gene algorithm. Now, what is blood-based transcriptomes? So basically, transcriptomes are full-range mRNA. mRNA are 
um, messenger RNAs that contain all the important genetic information in our body. And mRNA uh, helps us to build the, the proteins needed for structure and other biological and functional pathways in our body. And so, so now you would think like, how would I be able to connect blood-based transcriptomes to suicidality? Like how? Well, we will be using brain genie algorithm. So basically this brain genie algorithm, it is uh, created by Dr. Hess and Dr. Glatt from Upstate, Upstate Medical University. Um, it is based on a multilinear linear, multi regression model and they used um, gene tissue um, expression, brain, blood, pair data sets to create that model. And if we impute or if we utilize the blood-based transcriptomes or peripheral blood samples to that algorithm, the algorithm assigns each gene found in the blood sample to a specific uh, brain region gene expression in the brain. So that's how we uh, finally look ways or be able to find windows window to somehow understand the molecular dynamics that's happening in the brain through that way. So in my um in my uh, capstone project, uh, I utilized the data set from um Dr. Hagigi's team, research team, and it comprised of 57,000 plus genes and 100 samples. And the metadata contained five columns and 100 samples. And for the methodology, uh, I performed multiple data cleaning and quality control to ensure that the data set or the genetic expression data sets, data set is, um, is free from lowly expressed genes. It is, uh, we, we will remove the duplicates at the same time we will be able to um, normalize and standardize it. And then after imputation, I performed two analyses. One is uh, differential gene expression analysis using Lima package in R. And the other one is gene set enrichment analysis. For the first analysis, um, differential gene expression analysis, um, it analyzes each individual gene expression in the data set. While gene set, gene set enrichment analysis, what it does is it excuse me, it um, groups or yeah, it groups all similar genes and then performs like pathway analysis out of it. So for my um, result, as you can see, uh, for the differential gene expression analysis, um, majority of the significant genes were found in the limbic system, which include amygdala, <clears throat> which include the amygdala. Let me just, if I can, sorry. So at the end, there you go. And then uh, aside from that, uh, cerebellar hemisphere also have like high um, significant genes found. As you can see, um, I have two different sets here. We've tried um, comparing MDD with high ideation versus MDD with no ideation versus, I mean, that one, one subset, uh, first subset, and then the other one is MDD with high ideation versus health control plus MDD with no ideation. For the first subset, we found like less significant genes because of, prob most likely because of the sample size, it's quite low. And, but the other one, but the second subset, it showed better results, like it, provided more um, better output, better number of differential gene expressions with um, P or F FBRP value of less than 0.1. And then most of the genes that were found were associated with um, molecular or metabolic processes and uh, hormonal, um, hormonal pathways as well. And for the gene set enrichment analysis, um, I only uh, provided like a Venn diagram for each subset. And most of the uh, findings were that uh, the 
abnormalities were found in um, metabolic processes at the same time, the inflammatory and immune response pathways were also dysregulated. Just to uh, give you an idea of what's the main point of this project is that it's, it's this way, it's, it's a new way of understanding or creating new ways to be able to um, molecularly understand at the same time, not just to diagnose, not just to treat, but also to monitor individuals who are suffering from such disease, such as suicidal um, behavior disorder and other neurologic, neuro neuropsychiatric disorders that cannot be, um, how do I say it, physically or visually like um, diagnosed. Yes. I think that's, yes. that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, you, Jerome. So let's go on now to, I think I said, uh, Rebecca. Yes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Becky or Rebecca Higginbottom, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, a study that I completed um, about the adolescent um, population. So I um, am attending Sony Oneonta, and I did this study um, in partnership with a local high school. It's a Corning Paint and Post area high school. And I wanted to um, just say thank you to my advisor, Dr. Emily Riddle, as well as the um, as well as the principal of the high school, Robin Sheehan, and the two health teachers who allowed me to go into their school uh, and uh, execute this, this fun study. So again, it's going to be, um, I studied the uh, changes in adolescent nutrition knowledge and self-efficacy following education and um, a hands-on intervention activity. Well, let's see. Why is my thing that? There we go. Okay. Um, so if you kind of look at as the more and more media is covering this, that the health in the United States is really not a particularly good picture at this point. Um, America spends 17.3% of our GDP on health care, and that is the highest among all of the top 38 um, most wealthy countries in the world. But that does not necessarily translate to health, unfortunately. Obesity rates are twice that of our, our other country peers. We rank along the, among the highest in death rates from avoidable and treatable conditions. Um, and in uh, about five years ago, there were estimates that 11% of Americans suffer from diabetes. Um, and that number has increased since then, including 8.5 million that don't even know they have it. Um, and the the prevalence of obesity among younger people um, has doubled in the last 30 years. So we're going in really the wrong direction. If we narrow in on adolescents, um, this population is really at a very critical life stage um, where they are making decisions and forming habits and behaviors that will last a lifetime for their own lifetime as well as their offspring, so the generations to come. Um, studies have shown that uh, children who are obese are five times more likely to be obese as adults. Osteoporosis, um, for example, the uh, nutrition and physical activity displayed as an adolescent has huge implications on your, your risk for osteoporosis later in life. Um, also things like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes. These are all very heavily influenced on that critical time of adolescence within the life cycle. That's also a time when parental influence is starting to wane and peer influence is starting to increase. So the influence of parents to have an effect on these habits is getting less. Despite the fact that adolescents make up 16% of the global population, there are very few studies really narrowed narrowed down to look at nutrition and the population of adolescents. So research in this area is really lacking. 
So what I did uh, last fall was I did a nutrition assessment at our local high school. And I asked uh, students in the health classes, about 200 students, to take these surveys. One of them was around nutrition beliefs and attitudes, things like, you know, hey, eating sugar causes diabetes or, you know, following a vegan plan is the best way to do it. You know, it's kind of what are the beliefs of these students? And then a questionnaire, you know, how often do you skip breakfast? Uh, how many vegetables do you eat in a, in a week kind of questions. And the results of that assessment really were, these students had an excellent understanding that eating healthy is important, but they lack the knowledge and the motivation to really execute on that, to really eat that balanced diet. So the study I'm talking about today is a follow-up from that and where we evaluated the effectiveness of a nutrition-focused classroom lecture in combination with a hands-on shopping activity and how that impacted nutrition knowledge and self-efficacy. The intervention itself, I did this in um, during health class. Um, during their normal uh, day at the classroom. And there were two sessions that we did. And it was really based on social cognitive theory based um, activities. So session one was a 15 to 20 minute classroom presentation. I covered four key topics and presented them in a sort of fact or fiction type format. And then we talked about the science based answer to that fact or fiction question. For example, one of the questions was, you know, fact or fiction, all calories are created equal. And we kind of, I asked the students to, you know, yes or no, fact or fiction. And then we talked about why that is or is not true. The second session was we set up a, uh, a basically a grocery store in the classroom and each, um, the students divided themselves up into teams and each team had to plan a meal and then shop for that meal calculate the nutrients of that meal using a very basic um, app on their, on their computers and then share the results and see how close they got to what the USDA recommends in terms of carbohydrate, protein, and fat breakdown within a meal. So it was really two components were involved in this intervention. Before and after the intervention, I used three different tools to assess the effectiveness of this. And each of the tools um, was really after getting to a different key aspect of healthy eating. The first tool was a nutrition knowledge survey, somewhat similar to the one I did before, but asking questions um, you know, about the USDA. How many vegetables should you eat a, a, a day? Um, what are good fats? What are bad fats? So it was around nutrition knowledge. The second one was a self-efficacy questionnaire. They were asked 10 different sort of statements and they had to rank their confidence that they could actually do that statement. For example, um, I'll say no when my friends offer me junk food. You know, I'm really confident, a five, I could totally do that. Or no, not confident at all. That's only a one. So that was the, the self-efficacy questionnaire. And then the last one was really applying this knowledge to reading food labels. They were given this food label, which is for a carton of ice cream. And then I asked them questions. For example, question number one was, if you ate the whole carton of ice cream, how many calories would you eat? So they were given these three uh, tools before the intervention and then repeated again after the intervention. And what I was doing was comparing that change in knowledge. So if we look at the results, uh, we actually saw statistically significant improvements in, in all three of these uh, tools. So the nutrition knowledge survey, there's a score of zero to 100, they could get a highest 100%. And there was a change of about 3.3 points. And that's, you know, according to the statistics is a relatively small effect. So was statistically significant, but on the small side. The self-efficacy questionnaire, we saw a 2.7 point increase. This is on a possible score of 50 from zero to 50. And that statistically is deemed as a moderate effect. So a little bit more of an impact on that self-efficacy. And then the final one around looking at the labels, 
Did they learn how to apply what they're learning? There was a pretty significant change on a score from zero to 100. The average score, the mean score, changed from about 81 to almost 92% correct. So there were 50 students who um, participated in this. The, there were actually two, over 200 students who did the whole thing. They took the, the assessments, they did the intervention, and then took the assessment after. But only 50 of those students I had both a parental consent form for and a student assent form. Because they're minors, we had to get both. So that kind of ended up whittling the numbers down to only about 50 students whose data I could use. So in my opinion, my interpretation of this is there is hope. You know, we can really turn the tide for health in the U.S. Um, and one of the biggest places we should focus is adolescence. And the social cognitive theory based intervention that was used here did seem to have an impact on adolescent knowledge scores, self-efficacy um, and their application of that in the real world. Second point is the design and the results of this study can really be used as a foundation for other very similar, maybe bigger research efforts to really look at improving the health of adolescents in the US and across the world for that matter. And then thirdly, more kind of uh, in, in real, real time, we can start integrating classes and activities like this in the classrooms for adolescents to improve that nutrition education effectiveness. And that's all I have. So I will turn it over. I hope I didn't go over my time. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. No, you're, you're perfectly in time. So uh, next we will have um, Leanna. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. My name is Lana Kalinowski, and I am in my final few weeks of my Master of Public Health at the University at Buffalo. This afternoon, I'm going to be talking about uh, my culminating project that I did for my MPH, where I explored age differences and how anti-tobacco messages are remembered. And I did this under the direction of my supervisor, Dr. Jessica Kulak. So we're going from adolescents to older adults here. So I wanted to start my talk today explaining why I was interested in this topic and why I think that this age group is so important. So older adults who I'm defining throughout this presentation as those 65 and older are the only age group whose smoking behaviors have remained relatively unchanged for the last 20 years. So you can see this graph that I have on the slide here, um, the only line that does not have a downward downward slope over the last 20 years is this thick black line, which signifies the older than 65 age group. We also know that tobacco control policies do not affect older smokers in the same way that they affect younger smokers. For example, one study found that in countries that implemented comprehensive tobacco control policies, such as health warning labels and smoke-free policies, these interventions were only more effective in those younger than the age of 65. Now, there are many different approaches to tobacco campaigns and public health campaigns, but for my project, I wanted to zero in on one of the most common avenues for public health interventions, mass media. Mass media includes things such as television, billboards, and social media, and it is particularly useful for delivering anti-tobacco messages to wide audiences. Now, when considering mass media, it's really important to consider with this uh, you know, area of public health intervention, it's the fact that we know older adults consume it differently compared to other age groups. For example, this group is more likely to listen to the radio or read print media and is less likely to use some of the more popul so popular social media platforms such as Snapchat and TikTok. So with these two facts in mind, my research question for my culminating project was, are there age differences in whether anti-tobacco messages are seen or heard across different messaging venues and media types? To do this, I analyzed data from the 2022 Health Information National Trend Survey, or HINT-6 for those that are familiar with the survey, 
And essentially what this survey is, is it asks the public about their knowledge of, attitudes toward, and use of cancer and health-related information. As this is a survey, these responses are self-reported, but what's so great about this particular survey is that it's administered by the NIH to a nationally representative sample of U.S. adults. So for the 2022 edition of this survey, the sample size for the questions that I was analyzing was 6,252. My primary survey item of interest was a question that asked survey completers during the past three months, have you noticed or heard any anti-tobacco messages, that is messages that talk about the dangers of tobacco products or encourage quitting in any of the following places? And then they were given a list of 11 places, uh, different messaging venues and media types. Some examples of these were billboards, radio, and social media. And then they were asked to check the boxes next to these items and whether that applied to that particular item. For my analyses, I ran multivariable logistic regressions with one model for each messaging venue or media type. My predictor variable in each of these models was age group, which I recorded into the following groups, 18 to 34, 35 to 49, 50 to 64, and 65 plus. And then my outcome variables were whether or not the survey respondent reported seeing or hearing anti-tobacco messages in that particular venue, which was based on the response to that question that I listed on the previous slide. I also included several important covariates in each of these models, including race and ethnicity, gender, education, income, and current smoking status. So diving right into the results here, I first want to start with some descriptives. So I found that the top five sources of anti-tobacco messages that were remembered across all ages were one, television and streaming, which was noticed by 36.15% of all respondents billboards, which were noticed by 20.33% of all respondents, stores, which were noticed by 19.9% of all respondents, radio, which was noticed by 13.52% of all respondents, and then social media, which was noticed by 12.32% of all respondents. So for the remainder of my talk, I'll be focusing on these five messaging sources. So moving on to the regression results, this table contains adjusted odds ratios for the different age comparisons across each messaging source. The reference group for all analyses was the 65 plus age group and any cell that contains an asterisk, so I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but this indicates a significant difference at the 0.05 level. Um, so as you can see here, lots of asterisks here, and this means that there are significant age differences in whether the top, each of the top five messaging sources were seen or heard. The only exception technically was the comparison between the 18 to 34 and 65 age groups uh, for noticing radio ads. It was technically not significant, but the p-value was equal to 0 0.051. So take that as you will, it was very close. Um, for the rest of the chart, the cells that I shaded in dark blue were noticed less often by older adults compared to the other age groups. So you can see here, billboards, stores, radio, and social media were all noticed less often by the older adults compared to all of these other age groups. And then the only one where the older adults noticed it more often than the younger age groups was television or streaming across the board. So before going on to my conclusions here, I wanted to mention some limitations of this particular survey. So first, TV and streaming services were combined into one item on the survey. So I have no way of teasing out the differences between these two platforms. I think this is a very important distinction because not only is advertising different across these two platforms, you know, if you've watched TV versus streamed a movie on Netflix, the types of ads and the length of the ads are gonna be different. Um, but also media consumptions are different across these two different platforms. For example, we know that 97% of older adults watch television, but only 55% of them use streaming services. So combining them into one item for these purposes isn't the most helpful uh, for teasing out those differences there. Second, the social media item was not disaggregated by platform, and we know that there are age differences in what social media platforms are used. For example, the only two social media platforms that are used by a considerable percentage of older adults are Facebook and YouTube, while younger adults are more likely to use platforms such as Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. One exception to this is YouTube, which is used consistently across the board by everyone, so at least there's a little bit of overlap there. 
Um, but then finally, my conclusions, regardless of those limitations, I'm confident in saying that there are still significant age differences in whether anti-tobacco messages are seen or heard across different messaging venues and media types. These results indicate that public health messages, both in general and specific to anti-tobacco messages, should be adapted to target older adults more effectively. Why is this important? Underexposure to these messages in certain venues deepens the health inequities observed by older adults, and addressing these differences is crucial for enhance, enhancing anti-tobacco efforts for all ages. While it is true that smoking prevalence among older adults is lower than all other age groups, I want to remind everyone that smoking prevalence among this age group has not changed in the last 20 years, and that's something that we should be hoping to change. Um, so from these results, I think an important next step is to investigate which factors lead to messages in certain venues being seen or heard more often than others. I have some examples listed here on the slide. So for example, what are the age differences in using or accessing these different media venues or type? Are there accessibility issues in getting to the store, looking at billboards, or you know, what are the media consumption pa pla patterns looking like? Another question I have is what is the content of these messages and is this content relevant to different age groups? You no know, messages that focus on prevention will not resonate with older, older adults because this group generally does not become new smokers, but messages that focus on smoking ces cessation might. And then lastly, are age differences in perception and memory at play here? You know, all of these are very important questions to consider in the future. So with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I look forward to any questions that you have in the later part of the session. But if you have any lingering questions that come after the fact, my email address is listed on the slide here. Thanks so much. Thanks, Leanna. And now uh, we'll have uh, Tyler uh, round out the, the presentations, and then we'll go into the question and answer. Uh, Tyler? Just one second as I get it started. <clears throat> Is everyone able to see my slides properly? Yep, you're you're fine. Fantastic. Make sure that I can get my laser pointer and then we will get going. All right, hi everyone, my name is Tyler Rollins. I'm a PhD candidate in the lab of Brian Weil at IUB. Uh, we're in the Department of Physiology under the D Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. Uh, my project today is titled, Mesenchymal Stem Cell Derived Extracellular Vesicles Mitigate Mitochondrial DNA-Induced Activation of Porcine Peripheral Blood Mononuclear Cells. Uh, it's quite a mouthful, so a more digestible title to handle is MSC EV therapy to reduce inflammation that is seen after cardiac arrest. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge all of our collaborators and especially uh, two uh, great undergraduates that helped me with this work, as well as the American Heart Association for my pre-doctoral fellowship. All right, so jumping right into the background and why this matters. So as you all probably know, the heart pumps blood throughout your whole body. The most important part of this is delivery of both oxygen and uh, nutrients and different uh, levels of electrolytes throughout the whole body. And it's critical that this pump uh, stays active throughout your whole life. Tyler, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your slides aren't advancing on the screen. Oh, gosh. I don't know the problem then. Sometimes if you stop the share and then reshare, that might help. It might just be frozen on this one screen. Yeah. Let me try real quick. Thank you for letting me know. All right, hopefully everyone can see them now. Is everyone seeing a diagram of the heart? Yep, yep okay. that looks good. Yeah, so the heart pumps blood throughout the body, delivering oxygen and nutrients. Uh, so central to our work is the definition, or I guess the difference between what a heart attack and cardiac arrest is. In uh, the media, uh, many people use these interchangeably, but they're very different uh, cardiac conditions. 
Uh, first, heart attack. That is a blockage of just one region of the heart where no blood is only delivered to one small part of the heart or even a larger region of the heart. When this happens, you have tightness or pain in your chest and you do still stay conscious. On the other hand, cardiac arrest, this is when the heart completely stops pumping blood throughout your body and very rapidly uh, you lose your consciousness and then you have to begin CPR. So what is out of hospital cardiac arrest? Out of hospital cardiac arrest just means that it's happening outside the hospital and cardiac arrest itself is the cessation of cardiac mechanical activity as confirmed by the absence of signs of circulation. This is usually caused by either medical conditions such as respiratory arrest, uh, a heart attack that can turn into a cardiac arrest or external factors such as overdose, asphyxiation or trauma. Uh, when cardiac arrest happens, the heart appears to quiver uh, due to unorganized electrical impulses. And because of these uh, quivers, it does not send oxygen throughout the whole body, most importantly to your brain. If resuscitation attempts are unsuccessful, this is referred to as SCD or sudden cardiac death. So cardiac arrest maintain, remains a significant public health problem. Uh, just in uh, February of 24, the American Heart Association put out um, updated statistics. The annual incidence amongst uh, US adults is 375,000 people. The return of spontaneous circulation or successful resuscitation occurs in only 25% of those individuals. Only 9.3% of those people actually survive to hospital discharge. And of those people, 7.5 have good functional status. The U.S. economic burden of just the health care to post-arrest care is $44 billion a year. And all of these values have actually worsened since 2021. The biggest thing I want to draw your attention to is the difference between the amount of people that are resuscitated and the survival to discharge. What causes this? It's pretty well established now that inflammation after resuscitation from cardiac arrest is this main cause but there are not many uh, therapies out there to address this gap. So there is a need for effective therapies to reduce inflammation and improve clinical outcomes in cardiac arrest. Now I'm gonna shift to a potential trigger of this inflammation. So mitochondria normally, as you guys have all learned, is the powerhouse of the cell, but it does many additional roles. One feature that my research is focused on is mitochondrial DNA, uh, which encodes the important genes for the electron transport chain for oxidative phosphorylation. But interestingly, 1.5 billion years ago, uh, mitochondria actually was a bacteria that uh, integrated into our eukaryotic cells. Because of this, unlike our own uh, genomic nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA contains bacterial motifs that immune cells can recognize as foreign and through this, increase inflammation, which is seen in cardiac arrest. One way that we can try to mitigate this is through the use of mesenchymal stem cells, otherwise known as MSCs. They have multiple functions, including the ability to help making new blood vessels. They can inhibit a cell death. They can induce proliferation or cell growth, a differentiation into multiple different cell types. They can help with wound repair as well as they can modulate the immune cell response. Looking specifically at one aspect of the immune cell uh, modulation, I'm gonna draw your attention to uh, these little guys that are called uh, extracellular vesicles. So in this context, MSC-derived EVs or MSC-EVs, uh, these are very, very small. They're only about 100 nanometers in diameter, and they're very important for cell-to-cell -cell communication. They usually contain regenerative factors as well as these immune cell modulatory factors itself. So in this context, can MSC-EVs protect against inflammation that we see after cardiac arrest? Our approach is to isolate out mesenchymal stem cell EVs uh, from uh, not the plasma in this context. We actually culture them. Uh, we do a size exclusion chromatography to only keep those 100 nanometer vesicles. We characterize them uh, using uh, Brownian motion uh, in order to uh, determine uh, the diameter of these particles. And in these samples, we see that most of them are between 80 and 100 nanometers in diameter. 
I additionally characterized them with a specialized Western blot in order to characterize them as an EV population, which all the positive markers do show up. For the experiment that I ran, uh, I started with these peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which are just our leukocytes or immune cells. I cultured them for one week, changing the media every day. And then I did a 24-hour activation assay with mitochondrial DNA, which we know is a trigger of this inflammation and cardiac arrest. Then concomitantly, I inhibited or tried to inhibit this response with increasing doses of mesenchymal stem cell EVs. Then from there, I used flow cytometry, ELISA, and qPCR to assess if MSC EVs could actually reduce that inflammation. So I'm going to orient you to the first graph, and the same layout will be for all of the rest. We have our negative control in the first well. Then we have everything under the line is treated with mitochondrial DNA, but then increasing number of MSC EVs. So from left to right, you have more and more EVs that, at least what I hypothesized, would uh, reduce this inflammatory activation. On flow cytometry, looking at our population of inflammatory dendritic cells, we see that compared to the negative control, uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, creates this inflammatory cell shift. But with increasing uh, concentrations of or MSC EVs, we actually reduce that shift of these inflammatory cell types. This is also seen in the inflammatory uh, transcript, which is mRNA of TNF alpha, where as you increase the concentration of MSC EVs, you reduce the signaling of TNF alpha. TNF alpha as a transcript then leads to the release of inflammatory cytokines, which are proteins that are secreted from these immune cells. And compared to a negative control, uh, mitochondrial DNA does stimulate the release of TNF alpha and then subsequent increasing doses of MSC EVs uh, inhibit that inflammatory burden. Last, uh, this is looking at reactive oxygen species, which drive a lot of this inflammation that happens. So ROS or um, reactive nitrogen species also fall into this uh, category. After uh, stimulus with mitochondrial DNA, we see uh, larger than a two-fold increase from negative control that is then attenuated by a treatment with MSC EVs. So overall, MSC EVs can reduce inflammation that is observed after cardiac arrest uh, by mitochondrial DNA. Overall, only seven out of 100 people survive after cardiac arrest with good neurological function. So because of that, there's a large unmet therapeutic need to increase survival, improve public health, and minimize the economic burden of cardiac arrest. Our data suggests that MSC EVs can reduce mitochondrial DNA induced inflammation following cardiac arrest. And overall, MSC EVs are a novel therapeutic option to reduce the severity of cardiac arrest and increase the rate of patient survival with good neurological function. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening and please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Tyler. Um, while people are getting questions together, um, let me just make um, a general comment. And then I'd like to pose a question to, to all of you on the panel. Uh, first of all, I think the the research that we we saw on the panel really does highlight the the diversity of of healthcare research that we've got going on across across SUNY. I would, um, you know, in terms of a question, I mean the the title of the panel is improving healthcare through breakthrough research. So if I could ask uh, each of you to think a little bit or to to, um, uh, to discuss a little bit how the basic research you looked at really can translate into healthcare. Some of you touched on this a little bit, others not so much, but I, I wanted to kind of draw things together by referring back to the to the topic of the of the panel. And I've got some more specific questions if if uh, if need be, but go ahead. Whoever wants to jump in. I can start. Um, so cardiac arrest is a large economic burden uh, to the healthcare system. And that $44 billion a year is just the healthcare costs in the hospital. Those people usually take a year or longer to return to the workforce, inducing even larger of a detriment to the US economy. Um, 
what's interesting about this is that the inflammation afterwards uh, has been known since about 1970, and nothing has really been developed in order to address this inflammation that's seen. Uh, part of this is, is that a, only a really, really small amount of funding has gone towards cardiac arrest within the NIH funding uh, structure. Um, and that doesn't necessarily match up with the amount of people that have died or do die every single year from cardiac arrest. So there is a significant gap there, and we're hoping to at least you know, start to chip away or start the conversation to lead to more therapeutics to help those who are resuscitated. I, I was I was wondering about that, Tyler. I mean, the the this this effect of the MSC EVs in reducing inflammation is that something that can be applied as an exogenous therapy, or do we have to think about what are ways that we can stimulate patients to uh, elevate their own MSC EVs? Yeah. So. Uh, that would likely be an off the shelf type of cell therapy that you're able to deliver. Um, that way it can be at the time of need uh, for cardiac arrest. Most of the cardiac arrests are sudden in nature. So you can't really plan for it happening. So you wouldn't be able to culture those cells from patients and then readminister them them uh, you know, when you actually need them within those first few hours. Uh, so it would probably be some off the shelf therapy, but this work is also leading to more of the molecular mechanisms that we can maybe target with a small molecule drugs. I'll maybe make a quick comment, um, Keith, on this one. It's, it's funny because you used the word breakthrough research. And I think as I thought about that question, um, eating healthy doesn't sound very breakthrough, right? It's like, well, that's kind of common knowledge. But I think um, one of the things that we have to really focus on as a country, if we're ever going to get, as, as Tyler mentioned, some of these medical bills and spending under control is to really push back some of these fundamentals as early into the process as we can. And that means zeroing on younger people, making sure that you know pregnancies and things like that are successful and people are really getting their health um, ownership of their own health, as well as the policies and support and um, food industry regulation and things like that, that really, and it has to really come all together. And to me, that's breakthrough. You can't rely on an individual to fix it. You can't rely on just on government to fix it. It really takes the whole picture, as well as you know some of the fundamental research that that people in this room are doing. So um, maybe that's my comment. <laughs> well, no, I was going to say. I mean, you you found you found some significant uh, um, treatment effects from your intervention, and I guess a couple of questions I had would be: Do you feel this is an intervention that could be scaled up? And also, what would you want to to know about to understand whether the effects that you saw, whether this intervention sticks over time, or if this is just a, a an effect of the you know concentrated attention that you know, comes from this kind of study. Yeah, is that, is that to me specifically, That's or is that to whole group? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll follow up um, to you. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's a it's an excellent question, and that's actually one of the 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 negatives or the not so the weaknesses of my study is that it was very focused, really short. Um, and what you have to do is really integrate the whole environment um, in order to make a real change. It takes what I was focused on is kind of an individual's behavior. Um, but that's only one component of health um, where you have to do the environment around them also and make uh, make eating cool rather than um, having it be a painful side effect that I have to deal with, right? And I think that's really where we'll get the bigger bang for the buck. Um, I think if you're talking to adolescents in school, unless there's some motivation, it's really tough to kind of crack that nut. And so I think this is one piece of the puzzle, but it alone isn't going to solve the problem, realistically. Yeah. So, so, Gerald, just to follow up on this kind of general question, um, you know, I got the take home from your talk that the analysis you we were able to do 
had a, kind of a twofold benefit. One is, you know, these markers could actually be used to identify individuals at risk. And, you know, that presumably if I have a, a, a direct um, tie in to, to healthcare. I'm wondering about the other thing that you mentioned, though, the, the, the um, possibility of identifying specific um, differential gene expression associated with um, suicidal ideation or whatever your measures, you know, whatever measures you're looking at. If you look at those, do do you see any patterns there that that you can make the the connection of gene expression to uh, you know specific biochemical or physiological um, uh, factors that are going on in in individuals that might have an impact on a mental state? So most of the uh, differential gene expression that I found were linked or more on connected to um, dysregulation in bio, uh, metabolic processes and also like uh, inflammatory and immune response pathways. And yeah, and just to add like, yeah, uh, just to add something about the paper that I'm currently working on, um, it's not, I mean, it's, I mean, suicide diet is just one part of it. Like you can use the method and the algorithm itself to other um, neuropsychiatric disorders or other uh, neurodegenerative disorders to understand the molecular dynamics happening in the brain. Yeah. So uh, Isabella, let me put you on the spot because you had a question in the chat that uh, was directed to Leanna, which I think is, Somewhat along these same lines of you know how to how to take this further and and so if you want to uh, to pose that to her, yeah sure um, yeah I was uh, you know very very interested in um, um, as you know we we was ev evaluate the effect of uh, advertisement campaign for for health it's a very important topic that Liana uh, talked about so. Um, in the past, we could analyze uh, Twitter data, but unfortunately, since <laughs> Twitter has uh, changed ownership, then um, it's much more difficult to get access to this data. I have students who analyze actually social network data from Twitter to, to evaluate the effect of campaigns. So now this data is much not available, but uh, there is still some data available that it's possible to get access to. So I was wondering whether it would be um, another step that uh, Liana could uh, pursue or whether she had thought about it. Yeah, thank you so much for posing that question. This is something that I have thought about, you know, especially because the HIT survey is nationally representative. And, you know, how can you determine what ads are actually being sent out versus what are being received? And one way you can do that is by analyzing social media data, you know, realistically, because I'm in the last couple of weeks of my degree, this won't be something that I'll be doing personally, but I do think that it is really, really important. And I think that it is something that people should, you know, consider as they're looking into this area of research. Yeah. And let me follow up on that as, or, or maybe take a little bit of a different tack. I was wondering if you have any thoughts or impression about whether certain media platforms platforms might actually be more effective at getting an anti-smoking message across. Uh, and, you know, if you've got something showing up in a social media feed that tends to be more personalized, are you, are you more likely to respond to it compared to just, uh, oh, here's another ad on TV, another, another public service announcement on TV about smoking is bad. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts about differences among the different media platforms and, and the fact that different age groups consume different media platforms that might have an impact on the efficacy of, of messaging that are, we're, is going out to different age groups? Yeah, I think a good starting point there is you need to make sure that the message is being received by the people that you want to receive it. So if that means you know, targeting YouTube because that's used by a considerable proportion of the population, then maybe that's an area that that you should consider. Um, but I also think that, 
public health interventions for smoking goes beyond just mass media campaigns. You know, you need to have a combination of factors in order to be the most effective here, you know, warning labels on on, on packs of cigarettes or, um, you know, taxes and things along those lines to, to make smoking less appealing to people. So yes, it should be considered, you know, cross-platform differences should be considered, but it also shouldn't be the only thing that's considered. Or, or Becky, um, warning labels on junk food or taxes on sodas, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And processed food and things like that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, I think consumer education is, is one of the most powerful tools that we have. Um, and unfortunately there's so much, um, there is a lot of, um, you know, lobbying and things like that from powerful, um, you know, people who sell this stuff, that it's, it's, it's difficult to, to weed through that um, and really get to the meat of what is, what, what really do people need to understand to make the right decisions for themselves? So we have a, a question off of that, actually. So Go like ahead. decisions for yourself, uh, especially in like adolescence and teens, mm -hmm. uh, since they're, you know, usually under the guidance of their parents, uh, I guess, is there a difference between just like exposure um, and do you provide tools to them to make those changes and impacts with their parents? Or do you expect this to just be kind of a time related change where, you know, over their young adult life and the rest of their life, those changes actually take place? Um, yeah, I, th I think that you have to, it was interesting talking to some of the teachers. So I worked very closely with two health high school health teachers to execute this. And one of the things they said is just be aware, you might get a response from parents because parents don't want us to tell their kids what to eat. And I'm like, ah, like <laughs> you're a health teacher and you're not supposed to tell your the students what to eat. Um, and so what, you know, that sort of changed my perspective of, you have to present this sort of things as I'm not going to tell you what to eat teenager who doesn't want to be told what to eat. Anyway, I'm going to give you the tools and I'm going to tell you the science and, you know, kind of what may or may not have, you know, what are those things that you need to know when you make these decisions and kind of get them aware of, Hey, if you eat a really, really sugary breakfast, you're tired, right? You hit a wall at about noon, don't you? I can tell you why. <laughs> and so kind of make it personal. Um, I don't know if I really answered your question, but I think it's, you can't tell them what to do. And frankly, now you can't tell their parents what to do either. Um, so it's more of an educational effort in my, in my experience so far. <laughs> but maybe you'll have the kids tell their parents what to eat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, was, that actually came up a few times. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I want to thank the panelists for some great presentations and a good conversation here. Uh, like I say, uh, there's just a, a broad wealth of, of health-related uh, research scholarship that's going on um, as represented in the sessions we had today, and thank you all. Now, I think we have a little bit of a break before we have the breakout rooms and someone presumably will come on and tell us what we need to do. Yep, I'm here. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>